start. So in about 40 minutes. Okay. Well, if not, uh, we can just I leave. Can't wait for him really now. So should we go on without him and then just whenever he okay. joins? Yes, we can start without him and whenever he joins. Okay. Just uh, we'll we'll leave your presentation for the for the end then. Um, that's um, that's okay. Um, one second. Uh, no, it's no problem. I can do the full, but it's nice oh. if it's there as well. Okay. Well, we can wait anyway. Just um, have um, I don't know if you have any preferences in the running order. Um, Martin, so handy. You want to go first? It, either of you? I don't mind. Okay, we didn't set up anything in particular, just in these cases. Okay, so Sohan, Martin, and then you, Elias, just in case, hopefully, Chris joins um, on time. Um, okay, um, one second, I'm gonna... Um, if he joins earlier on time, we can do it second to me, because he might have to go again. Later. It's fine, okay. If he joins, will you, 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 again, Martin, you will yes. go third. Please okay. do it like this, because then... It's 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 okay. It's okay. No problem. Depending um, the other meeting, and uh, he doesn't want to. That's fine. Well, okay. I, I, um, know, I know that you have to enable screen sharing at some point. And I should. That's true. And you all should be able to share screen. Um, right now. So the button should be there. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Um, Okay, should we go live now? Yeah. Is it already? Okay, I think we're going to go live. So again, in, well, Michael will start speaking. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone to um, our next Singularity Talk. We are the Astoria Society. Um, I'm Joaquin, the president, and today we have from the committee here, uh, Marco, Salome, and Silvia. And today we have we are going to be chatting and also hearing some presentations from the Norse board. So, Ilias, Martin, and Sohan. So, um, Martin is uh, the president of the network and also reading astronomy at the University of San Andreas. We also have um, Elias, the CEO of NORSO, and professor of mi in mineralogy and petrology at the National and Technical University of Athens in Greece. Um, and we also have, last but not least, Sohan, uh, from the founder and chairman of NORSO, and its subsidiaries. Um, so NORSO, if in case you don't know, stands for the Network of Chemical Researchers on the Evolution of Life. Um, and I think before starting with the presentation, it would be nice if we could hear a bit more about NORSO. So, um, just um, what is it that for you, Sohan, is actually NORSA? Why setting it up, and what about it, what about its mission? What is it that it actually wants to pursue? Well, uh, the main the main aim actually being that um, that we'd like to involve a lot of people. We're kind of a, a community rather than normal run of the mill. Uh, what you see. Uh, um, um, conference groups out there. So we are we are community, and that's what I wanted right from day one back in 2013. And of course, Martin and Lily has been with me ever since then, and they can 
rubber stamp that, what I say, that that's what we wanted. And if you were to come to any of our meetings and conferences that we do, um, uh, you go away as you came in. In other words, you came in happy, you leave us happy. And that's the type of a atmosphere we instill during the uh, the the live meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, and uh, I hope that people would um, uh, look us up uh, on the um, network, which is www.norsel.net. So please do look us up. Thanks. Yeah, of course. I'm um, actually well. We were speaking about this before. Um, I don't know if you want to mention something about this. Um, your latest upcoming event, um, the Astro Science Fiction Exploration Network, happening on the 12th of April. Yes, we have got um, Astro Science Exploration Network, and that uh, is us in for short. That will take place on the 12th and the 13th of April. That's in about three weeks time. It's important that um, students from all over the world actually do join us in the sense that we're setting up a hub in Africa, starting in Zimbabwe. And from there onward, we'll expand further. And of course, uh, this particular meeting is kind of um, the, the, the inaugural meeting to get everybody going. But if you come on with us, you won't be sorry in the sense that you'd be invited to be part and parcel of that in the sense that you'd be communicating with Africans, uh, Africa-wide. And that's the whole essence of Atsin. And currently it is headed by Professor Golden Nimbua, and he is professor at the university, NAST, National uh, Technical University, Technical Science, Un National University of Science and Technology, mm -hmm. way that's the second largest city in Zimbabwe. I've been there since 2015. Actually, the atmosphere is electric. You must come and visit. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and well, um, moving on to you, Martin. Um, I think this is something um, so can briefly touch it upon. Um, but yeah, well, as I um, people may have um, deduced, you are essentially a physicist. Um, however, you belong to this um, chemical evolution network. So, what is the importance, um, and where is, uh, what, what do you find interesting about this the, inter the interface uh, between these two disciplines? Where, where that sits, and yeah, where is it uh, of your interest? So I, I really think that, you know, when we're pondering about whether not only physics and chemistry are universal, but also whether biology is, is, is universal, thinking about this in the, in the context of specific disciplines will not get us to our goal. Um, no, this has been approached from various perspectives, but we need to combine those. And so with NOSA, it, it really says what, it, it really is what it says on the tin. It's a network of research, researchers and we want to foster debate. We want to foster debate over a wider range of topics than people typically do when they're too entrenched into disciplinary thinking. And you know, I've been sitting on the fence on this, supporting so on this for quite a long time. And at some point it just caught me and I thought, you know, I have to, to get more active in it because we have such a great community together and we have a community of creative thinkers. And that's what we need. We need to think, we need to discuss, and this is how we can move science forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, well, um, people in the Astrobiology Society or the Astrobiology world in general tend to follow um, that line of thinking as well. And it's um, 
I hope they find us uh, um, not as, as a safe space, but to discuss those ideas on that interface. Um, and finally, I also wanted to comment on all these um, projects that those people have been following also for a long time, I'd be aware of. So together with us, and you've also been running the Blue Earth project, um, the Latin American Hub, which only had the meeting last month, um, the International Frontiers of Science, well, that, went, that, that, that was actually the latest, wasn't it? Um, and this microbiome network, um, so Elias, what 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 is it that you actually, you know, as a as an organization, want to to achieve with all these um this uh different projects? What what is the what is the ultimate goal for for you all? Um, personally, for me, uh, it was the question about the origins of life because I was involved in the research for with Martian meteorites. And uh, finally, through my research, I approached this topic uh, closer and closer from some findings I had in uh, special Martian meteorites. Uh, meeting Sohan actually inspired me to go even deeper in the origins of life. And uh, bringing forward North Cell was uh, this uh, focus that uh, we needed to uh, uh, to make an interdisciplinary group, a network of people, uh, of very different people with very different uh, ideas uh, coming together to solve this uh, difficult uh, question, problem, uh, which is the origin of life. And uh, this is the inspiring point for me uh, in this network. And I uh, we building this capacity through our people mostly and uh, geographically expanding. So we are in inclusive, uh, absolutely inclusive, and uh, also uh, in the disciplines, the different disciplines. Yeah, no, that's, it's it's definitely an inspiring mission, the one that I'm... Um, yeah, Sohan, do you want to add, that, add, add something to that? Yes, please. Um, let me uh, uh, bring in all the strands you've mentioned. Why have we got them? Well, NoCell is the parent group. So everything sits under NoCell, Network of Researchers on the Chemical Evolution of Life. We have International Frontiers of Sciences, which is every first Saturday of every November each year. So what that actually means is that we inspire all the students worldwide. So it is really to, uh, to get the... Uh, the students going and the postdocs going. And its purpose actually is that if they should join us, NoCell, the reason behind it is NoCell itself has an ultimate project, which is to convert into a NoCell Institute, Science and Education Research Institute. This is why, why we got the words like researchers and chemical evolution in our name within NOCEL. And if we're going to be eventually um, Science and Education Research Institute, NOCEL. Mm -hmm. Also, we've got Blue Earth Project because we care about the Earth itself. I know international large number of people which I can invite and get uh, some sort of involvement purely from scientific point of view, rather than uh, sort of uh, any other areas of th those, uh, uh, I don't want to mention some of them because they're vir virulent. And the other bit is that the Latin America hub, because we care about the developing nations, uh, that means that we want to uh, promulgate science network science, networking type of science in Latin America. And Miriam is head of that uh, uh, group. So she's part and parcel of that. So we're actually building it slowly like this. And then finally, we also have a microbiome. The reason the microbiome is in the equation, you might think, well, what's microbiome got to do with the origin of life? Hakim, I'll tell you something, it has everything to do with it. By definition, all the, uh, all the microorganisms in your gut are actually extremophiles. 
-hmm. And some of these um, microorganisms have lost their, um, their genetics. They actually steal other uh, micro, uh, 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 microorganisms products. It, they steal their metabolites in order to survive. And this is the type of uh, inter interaction occurred at the very, very early onset of uh, life's emergence, before Luca was ever there. There were these kind of uh, thieving going on or exchange between, between organisms going on. This is exactly what's happening uh, in microbiome. And Dave is head of that. And I manage along with uh, Dave. And um, so really, uh, really, we, uh, we have got everything facing the right way. And yeah. we'd like everybody to share, uh, share have a share of this uh, no cell. And if you came to us sad, you will leave us happy. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I get it. Yeah, um, I mean, they definitely sound like uh, uh, promising, and well, uh, as you know, we've uh, we've always been promoting them because we really believe in that mission. Um, and so coming on back to this point that Elias was, make, was making about this, well, inspiring mission that is um, searching for uh, during of life. I think it's time to start with the presentations. So, um, Sohan, if you want to go first, um, so. Sohan's going to talk to us about today uh, um, about astrochemistry and his research on uh, the formation of molecules and the different space conditions. Um, so in, indeed, um, in the end, um, the synthesis of the so-called building blocks of life. Um, so we can see that. Um, so okay. yeah, if you can enter the, present the presentation mode. Yeah, and that's... Yeah, so, so you yes. that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, my my name is So and Jita. Uh, I'm the founder and chairman of NoCell, Network of Researchers on the Chemical Evolution of Life. And so today I'm going to talk uh, about where were the molecules of life made. And I'll have to hurry. So there may be some bits of information I might miss, but I'll try not to because I've got a lot to say. People talk about that uh, life started from uh, very small molecules, you know, and they also think that there were around about 250 to uh, uh, 500 small molecules, which kind of got the life on the move, uh, so to speak, during the chemical evolution. Well, uh, to be quite honest, I question what does the word small actually means, because if you look at um, uh, look at the purine base, which is should be on your right uh, at the bottom with a double uh, uh, hexagon and pentagon ring rings. And uh, as you can see, the purine base, that's very, very big. You know, it's large, uh, large structure here. So I think when people talk about small molecules, I think they might mean that they are units, uh, 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 like, for example, pyramid units and uh, sugar units and uh, um, um, hydrogen cyanide, um, amino acids, and so on. And so I think it wasn't 250 to 500, it's more like up to maybe uh, 150, perhaps 100. Okay, so there are many, many places where life molecules could have been made, but one of the largest uh, where the molecule, this is according to me, where a lot of molecules might have been made would have been actually dark molecular clouds, as the horse had represent on the right hand side of my, my screen, it'd be left on yours, I think. But anyhow, I've listed seven uh, places here. There are a lot, lot more. Some people even got professorship by just mentioning or oh, this place of all, uh, uh, like, um, uh, like um, Clyding and it's still a dust particle, but they haven't used the formula in order to find out the mean distance between these, these places. But I'll come get back to you, I think, on the next slide. So let's move on. Uh, so dark molecular cloud. I'm not going to read the top panel. I'll just go to the next panel down, and we, which is that. These structures are irradiated by both particle rays, radiation. That would be like electron protons, uh, uh, and uh, uh, hydrogen atoms, as well as 
UV light, that's the electromagnetic radiation. They're composed of 80% dihydrogen by mass, and similarly by mass again, where I didn't write it down, but it should have been 19% uh, helium, and the less than 1% uh, is heavier elements uh, uh, beyond, beyond, say, for example, helium. And um, the interstellar dust, there are, um, there are 10 to the 6, that's million, uh, interstellar dust particles for, uh, uh, in um, one cubic centimeter of space um, compared to at least uh, uh, um, uh, hydrogen. So the pressure in such places is something like uh, 13 millibar and um, and the temperature is usually something like 10 to 50 K. Oh, uh, I don't know what happened there. So anyway, the chemistry that I'm today talking about is called solid phase chemistry. And um, interstellar dust particles, which is which are shown on the right hand side, a real life example, a real life example of interstellar dust particle, which is brought back to the earth by, in, uh, by um, Stardust spacecraft back in during the 1999 to 2006 mission. Um, so these are made up of 80% silicate and rest being carbonaceous material. And around them forms a amorphous ice a mantle, icy mantle. And uh, what that actually mean, amorphous actually means is kind of woolly kind of uh, material around, around these interstellar dust particles. And 20% of solid phase chemistry occurs in, um, on the surface of the, these, these IDPs. And it also occurs on the, uh, 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 on the surface of these IDPs are formation of dihydrogen shown in turquoise below uh, uh, at the bottom. And this is because um, you cannot form um, uh, join two hydrogen atom together because as soon as they come together, they fall apart again because the level of energy it generates. So what the interstellar dust particle as a third body uh, does is to take the heat away and allow the formation of dihydrogen. That's um, hydrogen as commonly known or molecular hydrogen. So that's what happens and it forms on the surface of such interstellar dust particles. Just to give you one example, and of course, uh, I want to get to the bottom of this in the sense here that how does the uh, chemistry occur? Well, it begins with uh, molecules in space. I've shown at the bottom carbon dioxide with red, red uh, oxygen atom and the black being the, uh, the carbon atom. What really happens is that um, molecules vibrate all the time, like backward and forward, like so. And when there's incident radiation onto the bonds of such as uh, carbon dioxide, for example, the bonds ex uh, expand. Upon um, uh, um, relaxation, it generates um, wave numbers. These are at specific frequencies as shown in the blue uh, box on the right side in red. And these wave numbers can be picked up if you were to tune a radio telescope such as the one that found in Joral Bank, and if you were to do that and pick it up uh, and convert those into some sort of a chart as shown here in, in white, this sort of a trace record shows you various peaks uh, the, uh, of various molecules in one particular protostar as uh, reported by Gibbs back in 2000. Uh, 2000. And the, the, the one on the left the one in green uh, it shows you top 10 molecules, first four one being, uh, being inorganic. And I want you to remember carbon, uh, sorry, methane, the third one, uh, oh, not methane, ammonia. I want you to remember that. And of course, I'll come back to that. And then the last uh, six are organic molecules. To date, around 145 molecules have been discovered and identified in such dark molecular cloud 
You might want to ask me, well, why haven't there been more than 145? It's quite simple because the molecules, or especially organic molecules, have different um, uh, um, uh, functional groups. These functional groups actually complicate the identification of, of these, uh, uh, these organic molecules. For example, alcohol, um, uh, car carboxylic group, they are functional groups. So such groups actually will complicate and that's why we only discovered about 145 or so. And these are the type of apparatus one can use to uh, uh, correlate what's in space if you're able to make in similar to space conditions. This is space, uh, this is a laboratory experiment. I'm not going to go through the setup here. It's too complex to, uh, uh, to go through. And then you have, what you have is that the sooner the radiation hits the, the ice, you can measure chemistry taking place in real time. In other words, chemistry begins as soon as uh, radiation impinges on it. By the way, it doesn't matter whether it is particle radiation or, uh, or UV light, except I will show you chem chemistry is the same. So on the right, on my left here, there's a black trace, that's the pre-radiation, and the, the red trace is the postal radiation. If you were to look at the wave numbers, which is at the x-axis, between 2,500 to 2,000, you see two small peaks. One is labeled uh, OCN minus cyanate, and the other one is carbon monoxide CO. <clears throat> These have been uh, um, um, made from irradiation of uh, ammonia and uh, alcohol, methyl alcohol, with one electron volt of radiation ice being at uh, 30 K. So the hydrogen, sorry, no hydrogen, nitrogen in ocean comes from the uh, nitrogen in, um, in ammonium. Next one slide being that to show you that there is chemistry going on, the destruction of molecules happening all the time and formation of molecules all the time, you can see that if you were to irradiate, say, for example, methyl cyanide with 200 keV protons, this time not, not electrons, but proton, red trace shows you that the, the methyl cyanide is being destroyed. Black trace shows you that there is a formation of methane because you can form methane from uh, uh, methyl cyanide. And the box on the right uh, tells you various other compounds that's been formed like ketamine, hydrogen cyanide, cyanoacetylene, and I've already mentioned the um, methane as well. And just to move the story along, some more results. So if you look at the, um, if you look at the first uh, column with ticks in it, that be irradiation, irradiating methanol with one kV. In other words, you don't actually have to have uh, a binary uh, starting reactants like uh, uh, like ammonia and methanol. You can have a single one like uh, uh, alcohol, alcohol here, methanol alcohol, methyl alcohol here. So the products that you form are ticked in the table. If you look, uh, look at the middle uh, column, you find that methanol being irradiated, irradiated by using um, um, UV light product forms that are the same, and these are being compared with ferrous, uh, ferrous is, uh, uh, they're not experiment, but measurements, uh, that'll be comas, which is uh, a tail of, uh, of comets. And you can see there's a list of organic molecules present uh, uh, also in the tail, meaning that the, uh, the chemistry in space is rich and varied. That's the take home message from this slide. And uh, on to this slide, what we got here is that I'm trying to show you uh, in yellow, you've got uh, on the right, uh, left hand side on the yellow, everything in yellow, it shows you that 
the different comp uh, compounds. So you can have, I've already mentioned methyl cyanide. You can also have inorganic uh, and inorganic ammonia and carbon dioxide breaking bonds to form cyanate, or CN minus, which is red if you read along the, uh, within the uh, middle column. And, um, and there are four products formed here all together from radiation of uh, two binary inorganic compounds. And of course, you can also have, as I said earlier, methane and methanol, that's a binary uh, uh, reactants for ammonia and, uh, uh, and um, uh, methanol. By the way, I misused the word. Uh, where I meant to say ammonia and carbon dioxide binary reactants, not products. So these are the biological uh, compounds that you could make, for example, cytosine and adenine. And the way that you would do it is very easy, actually. Cytocyanoacetylene, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is made during methyl cyanide uh, irradiation. And OCN is made during the irradiation of um, ammonia and carbon dioxide. And when you mix them up, almost instantaneously what you get uh, is cytosine. Cytosine, as you know, is one of the bases. The other base is adenine. Back in 1963, Oro uh, carried out this particular experiment where he took hydrogen cyanide, mixed it with ammonium, uh, ammonia, and um, he, uh, he heated the mixture up for a week or so. Lo and behold, he actually obtained uh, adenine. So this again tells you that there is increased number of um, products present uh, uh, in space. But don't take my word for it. Let's move on to the next slide. If you were to examine meteorites such as the one that fell in 1969 at, in Murchison in Australia, I'm almost finished, by the way. And, and if you were to examine burgundy, molecule, um, burgundy chondrules here, um, you drill them out, add a bit of acetone, a bit of HPLC, and, all, uh, and you'll get a list of uh, compound identified as in the table shown uh, from Gilmore and Wright 2003. They, they identified 18 amino acids altogether, which are on the left. And, um, and then of these 18 uh, amino acids, you got the six of them are found in the biology and used in biology today and they might have been used uh, uh, in previous uh, during the early chemical evolution of life and so what happens is that again it, it sort of tells you that there's large number of, uh, of uh, near to 200 uh, compounds have been found back uh, in um, meteorites um, such, meat, uh, such compound again increasing, increasing the tapestry of molecules in space. And these would have been delivered onto the surface of the Earth some 4.3 to 4 billion years ago. And we know that uh, for certain because of the moon. All the craters are testament to that era long ago. According to Gilmore and Wright again, um, that the level of uh, um, molecules that might have formed a veneer around the Earth's surface would have been something like 15 centimeter to one and a half meter. So you can find that in their uh, book, Introduction to Biology from the Open University. And that's all I have to say. With all these organic molecules being delivered onto the surface of the Earth, we have a beginnings of a new chapter of life's emergence on Earth. Big thank you for listening to my presentation, and I'll take questions after that. Thank you very much if we left any time. Thanks. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Sophan. Thank you for that. Um, I think I think that really good overview and really, really interesting. I'm going to quickly check. I think, um, well, this um, feedback in the chat is also saying that that was really interesting. Uh, we'll wait for some um meant to say if there are any questions i do have one um which is um so um i think i well i would like you to to um further develop this the instinct distinction let's call it like that when it comes to 
So we often talk about, we often speak about the building blocks of life, but um, to what extent the building blocks of life are just the building blocks of biology, if you get what I mean. Um, in another way, are these, um, what is the chance of having these building blocks um, if we ever found, if we ever find life elsewhere in, in, in the universe, or if we just by searching for these blocks elsewhere in the universe, does that necessarily mean we are going to find life? Or it just happens that they are used, they are, they are quite common, but on Earth and our um, neighborhood, it just the exact conditions happen, so life emerges based on these compounds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we know that we know quite a great deal from since 1932 when the first uh, molecule was detected. I think it was water, actually. <laughs> if, uh, uh, we know that that from uh, meteorite studies from um, from a uh, number of um, um, organs organic being identified during a radio astronomy and so on and also from systems chemistry synthetic chemistry and we know that from uh, 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 systems chemistry uh, biology as well that which were the uh, basic building blocks of life and as I said, <coughs> if you were to count them all and you'd find that there are uh, there are uh, probably most important one add up to about uh, something like 150 or less, not more than that. <laughs> and they're they're being made in space all the time. For example, formaldehyde is the basis for forming sugars. You know, yeah. and um, and of course uh, you know that this is happening because of a particular amino acid called um, cysteine. Now, uh, cysteine is made by biology because to date, no one has identified a certain high and low for this particular amino acid in the inventory of, um, of meteorites. No one found that. So we know that cysteine was biology made so the original, uh, there were originally only about 13 amino acids necessary for making life. And of course, uh, uh, if anybody wants to know that, they, they read my the latest paper I published uh, six months ago, um, way forward uh, for the uh, origin of life, just put Jita and you'll find me, you find the paper. Yeah, I saw that, um, the one that that's been nominated for the um, Life Award, as that one? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I'm definitely for anyone that's interested. I'm. I'm definitely worth. I'm worth checking. I, I did take a look. Um, and it's it, it definitely gives some insights into the topic. Um. Well. So thank you for that. Um. Just for the people watching us online, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the live chat. And if um, we can just have a, a quick overview. Uh, a, a quick um, look through all the questions at the end if they just come in the next few minutes. Um, do you want to add anything else? Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, so um, now that um, Elias and Christos, I don't know if you want to go next. So Christos has just joined us. Um, he is um, a professor of biochemistry at the University of Patras and Elias' colleague, and they are um, going to um, make the, um, the next presentation today. So they're... Um, Talk is going to be about reactive oxygen species and how um, and this the, the role of this in the astrogally world and the production of oxygen for planetary soils. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, are, if you can share your screen, Elias, and well, welcome, Krista. I'm so I'm sorry that you came in when we were already midway through. Um, but nice to meet you. Um, yeah. So I'm um, all yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, for the invitation as well uh, from both of us. Uh, I think you see my screen right now. Yeah, we can perfectly. Okay, perfect. And uh, what I'm going to do is actually to um, to talk to you about a new project uh, that is uh, is uh, funding at the moment, uh, which is going to make to develop an instrument, the OXR instrument. Uh, this is from, uh, 
it, it is going to sense uh, actually a reactive oxygen species or RIOs uh, as it's called and its uh, use in, uh, is in astrobiology and also uh, for the production of oxygen uh, from planetary soils. So in the small version of this instrument uh, you have a detector for uh, a reactive oxygen species and in the larger scale you can produce oxygen and you support life. So this is based on an original idea and a lot of work, years of work from Christos Georgiou, Professor Georgiou uh, at the University of Patras, who uh, developed all the theoretical and experimental background behind this uh, detection. And uh, I came in as a geologist, uh, mineralogist, petrologist, to, uh, to set up with him this project, which finally was successful and uh, is supported by ESA. Uh, together with us, we have a company, the Zero One Mechatronics, a Greek company, and they do a lot of automation work. They will build the system for us. And also they do microfluidics. So the system is going to be, the small system is going to be a microfluidic system. Uh, now, uh, we have some objectives. The first objective is to construct this instrument. Here you see a design, a prototype design, which is changing now as a, a design. And as I said, its purpose is to detect uh, reactive oxygen species through the release of oxygen gas when uh, it, they come in contact with water. And uh, they uh, also can, uh, it can also detect OH, uh, uh, spectroscopically. The objective, the second objective, is to produce materials on which we can test uh, this uh, uh, instrument and uh, we will do simulant soils, specific simulant uh, soils for lunar and uh, sim uh, simulant for, of lunar and Martian uh, uh, materials. Uh, in control environments, we want to have control environments in order to uh, easily quantify what uh, we observe. So the instrument operation will be tested and also with these uh, materials we will test the oxygen production efficiency from different soils. And uh, in the same objective uh, we have uh, additional uh, testing on different powders like pure minerals. Uh, we have several meteorites that we will destroy in order to test our instrument, including some lunar meteorites. And so we are now all, uh, trying to apply and uh, order some lunar regolith and dust samples from, uh, uh, from NASA. The third objective is, of course, to test the uh, OXAR device for astrobiology purposes. Uh, this means that we have to go also outside into the field and uh, look at it uh, in uh, real samples, uh, also on Earth, because uh, 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 reactive oxygen species exist, uh, of course, on Earth. And uh, here you have uh, two cases. One case is uh, when you have soils with high content in hydroperoxide, uh, then it's unlikely to find life there. And uh, all life signatures, uh, because life uh, suffers from oxidative stress and then living organisms cannot uh, live anymore. And uh, organics themselves uh, are uh, oxidized uh, by the reactive oxygen species and disappear. So you will not find life and uh, signatures of life but you can find soils without hydroperoxides. And these are actually the ones that we should go and investigate on other planets like Mars, for example, and sample those points. So it's an important instrument also to know which samples you should take now with the sample return missions. Uh, of course, it's not only for soils, the same system can work on ices on other uh, bodies of our planetary system. Uh, a, first, a fourth objective is the large scale instrument, which is uh, how we will investigate uh, oxygen production efficiency from, for IOSRU purposes, in situ resource utilization. Uh, and we have a concept to create some larger devices which will scan uh, an area uh, on uh, the surface of the moon, for example, and periodically scan this uh, area. And uh, then uh, they extract from the upper soil, they extract oxygen, and then they leave this area 
to be irradiated by the sun. And then again, they go and they extract the new uh, oxygen uh, released from the new uh, reactive oxygen species that uh, are uh, developed uh, from the cosmic and UV radiation of the sun. Uh, and that's why we call this concept oxygen farming. So what is planetary reactive oxygen species? Uh, uh, these are toxic chemicals, very toxic chemicals, uh, and uh, you will hear a little bit more about them from uh, Professor Yoryu. These are superoxides, uh, um, metal salts of the reactive oxygen species, uh, oxygen radical. Peroxides, again, metal salts of uh, uh, the ion of uh, oxygen, and then hydroxyl radicals. Uh, these are the, the one of the group. There are also additional ones uh, with uh, perchlorides, for example. But uh, you find those also on Earth, as I said, as I said, and they are produced from the UV radiation and uh, in reaction with the atmospheric oxygen. So you have a, a adsorbed superoxides, uh, superoxide ions. You have, again, superoxide metal salts. You have uh, peroxide metal salts. And uh, you see some examples here of uh, such molecules. On the moon, you find them from Fenton reactions uh, and cosmic ray and UV uh, radiation, and also from fracturing of minerals when micrometeorites impact the surface of the uh, uh, of the Moon or Mars, and from silicate abrasion uh, also on Mars because uh, uh, you have the dust storms. I will not stay longer on this slide, I will go to the next slide to show the astrobiological significance of ROS. Uh, I said already why it is important and how it can help us uh, select uh, areas with uh, possible life on Mars and uh, other uh, solar bodies. But uh, how this came into our mind is this the introduction slide, uh, which describes the very first uh, experiments, the very first mission to Mars from NASA, the Viking 1 and 2 missions, and the gas exchange experiment. Uh, this uh, had some uh, uh, nutrients, depositing and mixing some nutrients with uh, soils uh, of, the, of Mars, and you had some uh, oxygen release. The first uh, indication of possible presence of uh, reactive oxygen species uh, was because of this oxygen release. And uh, at this time, there was also another interpretation, possibly, and this is, was the target, actually, the purpose of uh, this, uh, this experiment on uh, Viking missions. It's the, uh, to find biological activity from Mars and life. But probably uh, this is not true, and uh, reactive oxygen species are extensively present on, uh, uh, on Mars. Uh, and I give now uh, the floor to Professor Georgiou to continue with this. If you switch on your microphone, Christos. Well, thank you, Elias, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, well, um, the very, very best, the first idea for about um, the, the existence of reactive oxygen species came exactly as Elias said from the NASA Viking 1 and 2 mission. That was in 1976. That was the first thus far mission for searching for life in our planetary system. And um, there were three, basically, four experiments that were designed in this mission uh, that, that they were trying to test if uh, there is life on uh, the soil. I say so, the surface soil of Mars. The mission was not very successful for the very, very first reason that uh, it's quite uh, impossible to find life on, uh, on a mineral surface about uh, six centimeter deep because of the constant uh, exposure to cosmic radiation, which would, even if there was life, it would oxidize and uh, obliterate any trace of life. Nevertheless, uh, the mission did the experiment, and the experiment consisted of what we call the pyrolytic uh, release experiment. 
it was just testing uh, carbon-14 labeled uh, carbon dioxide and monoxide gas assimilation by possible Martian life in, in the soil under simulated sunlight for five days. Well, um, after that, these five days, uh, CO2 and carbon monoxide were flushed out and the soil was heated up to 625 degrees to convert any organic matter to carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, there were, the results were negative. Another experiment, the second one, was testing consumption of carbon-14 labeled organic nutrients uh, by Martian uh, soil and uh, testing, looking for the release of C14 labeled gases. That experiment resulted in a positive result. Indeed, there were 14 carbon-14 gases emitted, most likely carbon dioxide. And the third and more, more important experiment was the gas exchange experiment where uh, the consumption of uh, car uh, 40, carbon-14 unlabeled nutrient by Martian life in soil was uh, tested on partially submerged in the nutrient soil under simulated Martian atmosphere and uh, any release of, of gases was uh, monitored by a GC and uh, to the, to the uh, uh, and the, the, the main result that came out was the release of oxygen, gaseous oxygen. And a fourth experiment was testing uh, for organics in the Martian soil by gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and the results were negative. So the result was no organics in the soil, but release of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is uh, thought of coming out of the organics of the nutrients coming into contact with reactive oxygen species, which oxidized the, the nutrients, released carbon dioxide, and at the same time released oxygen, where in a Martian atmosphere that lacks oxygen. The first uh, hypothesis for that was that probably most likely there was on the Martian soil, the superoxide radical. Superoxide radical, if we can move on the slides. Uh, yeah, we can leave it here. Superoxide radical, you can see the reaction here. Superoxide radical, if it is present in the, in the metal salt forms described by Elias in a previous slide, will come into contact with the water of the nutrient. You can see the reaction there. And there's going to be a dismutation reaction where uh, the superoxide radical is converted to hydrogen peroxide and gaseous oxygen. And this is what we think right now that uh, this is the source of oxygen that was detected in the Viking release, in the Viking experiment. Let's move on to the other slide. Well, um, we, uh, uh, my lab was um, specializing in the uh, measurement of these uh, highly reactive uh, uh, free radicals in uh, the human body, in organisms. So I got a call from uh, some colleagues from uh, NASA to collaborate with them in experiments that would uh, simulate the generation of superoxide radical and other reactive oxygen species on soils uh, from Atacama. Atacama soils are extremely dry and they resemble to Martian soil. So we did experiments and uh, we exposed the soils into UV and we found indeed, uh, this result was uh, 
published in Nature Communications, we found indeed the release of uh, superoxide radical, also the release of uh, hydrogen peroxide, and also the release of hydroxy radical. Uh, the hydroxy radical is uh, the last on the slide. So we presented the mechanism on how these things are taking place. We can move to another slide, to the next slide. Also, there was another experiment that uh, we did in collaboration with, uh, 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 with a colleague from uh, NASA, um, Richard, Richard Queen. This uh, gentleman, this uh, um, researcher, uh, found that perchlorates, which are found in, uh, on the moon, also are found in meteorites, as the slide shows, and also are found in high quantities on the Martian soil. Uh, when these uh, were exposed to, to cosmic radiation, um, perchlorate salts, um, and came into contact with water, they released oxygen. So when I visited uh, Richard Queen, I asked him if he has uh, any samples that I can take with me in Greece and test them. And uh, he did. And uh, what I did, what we did in my lab is we tested these same uh, samples, uh, perchlorate samples, which were exposed to cosmic radiation under simulated uh, Martian uh, atmosphere. We tested and we found that besides uh, releasing oxygen, they also release superoxide radicals upon water wetting, hydrogen peroxide and also hydroxy radicals. So that was a second uh, experiment that, uh, that proved, in, at least in experimentally, that uh, the generation of this uh, reactive oxygen species. We can move on to the other slide. And because of the release of oxygen, the idea, the idea came based on the reactions that, uh, that uh, uh, gaseous oxygen is the product of. Uh, then came the concept of, uh, of creating uh, uh, a device which can measure these uh, various reactive oxygen species after converting them stepwise to oxygen. So what you needed actually, you needed just an oxygen electron. And here you can see the idea. You have soil on the bottom of the container, uh, which is separated by a uh, filter. And then you introduce water and uh, a, a certain chemical that picks up uh, hydroxy radicals. So once the water comes into contact with a superoxide radical, we generate, you, you have a generation of, of gaseous oxygen, and at the same time, you have a generation of hydrogen peroxide. So at this stage, the oxygen electron can pick up the oxygen and measure it. Then uh, this liquid uh, moves on to another chamber where it comes into contact with MN oxygen, um, manganese dioxide. Manganese dioxide is a very, very important mineral because when it comes into contact with hydrogen peroxide, it, it converts it to oxygen. So we have another source of oxygen. Uh, we have a second measurement of oxygen. And if um, we are not going into more details, the, uh, the involved reactions are also shown on the slide. And you can move on to another, to the next slide, uh, which uh, you, Elias, pick up from. Yes, okay. Uh, closing, thank you very much. Closing this, you see that uh, uh, all these reactions produce oxygen. So we thought, uh, can we use this oxygen for human, res uh, human respiration? And we just uh, take, uh, took the uh, results from the Viking experiments and by calculating how much oxygen we can produce, it seems that we can, uh, if we just use the upper one centimeter of Martian soil or um, lunar soil and, co uh, con and uh, scan one hectare of this, 
uh, and we process this, then we get about 1,700 liters of oxygen, which is about 8,200 liters of breathable uh, air. And this is enough for an astronaut to work under moderate uh, working conditions uh, for 24 hours. So if you have a system that really scans the surface again and again and again after leaving it for some time to be radiated from the sun, we might be able to uh, permanently produce oxygen for, um, for us to breathe and also for energy. Uh, on uh, other planets. And with this, we close this uh, talk and thank you very much. Thank you, indeed. Um, I think that was, once again, um, a really nice talk. Yeah, we are off screen right now. So yeah, that should be in there. Um, uh, let me quickly check the chat and one, no questions so far. Um, I do have one as well, um, which is, um, I can't really, I think in the end, I thought about this question at the beginning and I think it wasn't really commented in the talk. Um, but my question was about the usability of this instrument. So yeah, um, you explained at the beginning how it could be, uh, well, the samples that we are going to use are reminiscent of those in the moon and Mars and that uh, we know about those soils. Um, so but what about other, the the potential applications to other bodies? Um, and if that, um, in, in, say, the um, scalability of the of the instrument and also if it could be the potential it has to perhaps in the future be on a rover and directly analyze samples or if it is a purely a an earth-based instrument well the aim is to make it uh, very simple and very compact to be um, employed on the rover mm -hmm. okay um so on yeah, uh, thanks, Akim. Uh, okay, so how do you see <laughs> how do you see yourself setting up a plant to produce constant supply of um, oxygen? Is that a realistic uh, possibility to produce? Oxygen? Yeah. Yeah. According to our calculations and with some engineering, yes, it is possible. And. Um, I mean, what sort of, uh, how big the plant has to be? I mean, I, I've not seen the reaction uh, 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 taking place, you know, but um, I'm just curious, you know. Uh, well, how... Elias, can I? Yeah, yes. yeah, please. Well, uh, the, the slide that Elias pre uh, presented to you is one possible application large-scale application. Another possible large-scale application is by using this instrument, we can pick up uh, sites, either on Mars or on the Moon, with minerals that are very, very rich with reactive oxygen species. So by just wetting with water these minerals, you just release oxygen right on spot. So you can have huge amounts of minerals and you can use them. So when are we going, by the way, leaving? When are we leaving? But <laughs> how am I joking? <laughs> <When are we? laughs> it is fine. Um, so yeah, um, well, again, once again, if anyone in, in the YouTube live has any questions, just stop in the chat and we'll, we'll, back, we'll get back to any, any questions at the end. And if not, we always tend to just also um, share answers with speakers afterwards the event, if any, if any of them come um, the following days, which is going to. Um, so last but not least, um, Martin, I think this means it's your turn to present. I'm um, slides ready. Um, so, um, Martin, for those of you that have joined us slightly late, um, is going to, to make a presentation on um, life in the universe and, well, quite an interesting t title, um, Getting Beyond quantify Quantifying Our Ignorance. Um, so, Martin, um, yeah, whenever you are ready, we are. Okay, slides are up. Okay. 
we are still are. It's not in presentation mode. I don't know. I, I don't know if you want it to be your. I think your email is in the background. Um. What? But it's not in presentation mode. Oh, I think. Yeah. yeah. Go back. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We can, we can definitely wait. And yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. One of you. Has shared correctly. Okay. Yeah. Who are we? What are we doing here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Is there anybody else out there? By studying nature, humankind explores its environment and places itself into context. The pinpoints of light on the night sky are most notable feature of nature. Having inspired humankind since antiquity to wonder about its existence and how it fits into the bigger picture. There are stars that appear to be fixed to a celestial sphere, planets that move slowly, and the occasional comet or supernova. It was suggested that stars might resemble the sun. We have supporting evidence for that since the 19th century. Wait a second, I'm out of sync. Um, let me try again. Okay, yeah, it's okay. We'll wait. Um, that's fine. Is it ready to go? Well, the screen sharing has failed. Cool. Um, I um, should we work in? I've done it again. Um, this and Sorry, I never had this kind of issues. Well, they uh, they also happen in person, but I guess that online it happens even more. Okay, that's my test slide. Now I'm in sync again. Okay, yeah. let me start again. Yeah. Who are we? What are we doing here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Is there anybody else out there? By studying nature, humankind explores its environment and places itself into context. The pinpoints of light on the night sky are most notable feature of nature, having inspired humankind since antiquity to wonder about its existence, and how it fits into the bigger picture. There are stars that appear to be fixed to a celestial sphere, planets that move slowly, and the occasional comet or supernova. It was suggested that stars might resemble the sun, and we have supporting evidence for that since the 19th century. However, until 1995, the sun was the only star known to us to be orbited by planets. 
By now, we know about 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. And this has changed everything. And this has changed nothing. Everything about the existence of planets, but nothing about whether there's life beyond Earth or not. The sheer diversity of planets and planetary systems, which is the most remarkable finding next to the large abundance, however, yet again challenges anthropocentric theories, which have a long history of having been proven wrong. Our minds find it hard to cope, not only with imagining the vastness of the universe, but along with it also its emptiness. Planet Earthverse is teeming with life all over. It was the advent of the space age with Sputnik 1 in 1957 that already opened the window to search for life beyond Earth within the solar system by means of space probes. Direct searches for life on Mars were conducted as early as 1976 with the two Viking landers. Now, Europa and Solus or Titan have become further targets of particular interest. Realizing that radio waves allow communication even over interstellar distances, Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison suggested a search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI in 1959, while Frank Drake was already setting one up. This is highly speculative but it isn't fiction, but reality, with the probability of success being difficult to estimate. What we know for sure, however, as Kokoni and Morrison pointed out, is that if we never search, the chances of success are zero. Serving as the agenda of a meeting organized by Frank Drake in 1961, he came up with an equation quantifying the ignorance of astronomers on civilizations transmitting radio signals throughout the universe. It writes the number of detectable civilizations in the Milky Way as a product of seven factors, each of which marked the topic for one of the days of the meeting. With current knowledge, the uncertainty on these factors broadly increases from left to right. The astronomical factors of the formation rate are star of suitable stars, the fraction FP of those with planetary systems, the number NE of planets per such system with conditions suitable for life, the biological factors of the fraction FL of such planets on which life actually develops, the fraction FI of life bearing planets on which intelligent life emerges. arbitrariness and choosing the factors. And Frank Drake's choice is not fit for the purpose of setting the research, research agenda or assembling the puzzle of life beyond Earth. A specific practical issue of the Drake equation is that it refers to the number of planets per system suitable to host life. But we do not know the road to life, which makes suitable to depend on a definition rather than empirical facts. However, we can split the respective factor into the number of planets per system and a habitable fraction. Moreover, this habitable fraction recombines with the probability for life to emerge to the empirically accessible biota fraction Fb. This actually eliminates habitability from the equations, which now instead refer to life. Many people still refer to the concept of habitability as some suitability to host life. But I actually feel lost amongst the lots of definitions of habitability and the lots of definitions 
of life. Moreover, the links between these two concepts lack clarity. Fuzzy concepts are challenging for exact science and ambiguous concepts are worse. We're close to the point at which nobody really understands what the other one is talking about. What do we actually learn? In 2014, the European Research Council hosted a session at the US Science Open Forum, ESOF, for which it issued a press release stating that Earth is the only habitable body in the solar system. This got me quite confused, given that this is either trivial if one defines habitable as having properties that only Earth matches, or it is wrong if habitability is considered a requirement for life to exist. Feel free to, to take your pick. Moba, there's no evidence that permits to rule out life on any planet. So all of them are habitable? I think that such communication issues could be indicative of underlying problems with concepts or with adequately framing research questions. It would seem to me that we actually made very little progress over the last 350 years on getting concrete. John Wilkins, one of the founding members of the Royal Society, speculated about life on the moon in the 17th century, notably using the term habitable with all its surrounding fuzziness in the most British fashion. His treatise, Discovery of a New World, is labeled as a discourse tending to prove that this probable that there may be another habitable world in the moon, which appears to be more honestly phrased than the many sensationalist statements that were made over the last decades. While habitability has been seen as means for guiding exploration, we now know that planets exist pretty much everywhere we look. And planetary systems show great diversity. This challenges both the usefulness of and the need for the concept of habitability. Let's talk about life. I think that a key reason why attempts towards a unified definition of life have failed is that at least two very different concepts are being conflated should better be separated. We can look at a collective process and ask, is there life? And also at individuals and individual beings and ask, is this a life? This can actually lead to contradictory answers. So I would want to argue that we should think about abandoning the concept of a unified definition of life and work with at least two different concepts here labeled e-life and i-life for evolutionary and individual respectively. Consider in particular the hypothetical case of individuals living forever, which would kill evolution. That is, eternal i-life would come with no e-life. Maybe we need even more than just two concepts. And it might be sensible to adopt definitions that are in conflict with some of our historic understanding of life. While the loss of thermodynamics govern physical and chemical processes, and in particular the entropy increases, we suddenly see life coming up and evolving a la Darwin, while entropy locally decreases. This is not forbidden per se, but why should on the emergence of life. The first is to detect many instances of life and reading off the conditions, or the second is finding the fundamental principle of nature that drives the transition. That is finding a framework that unifies thermodynamics with Darwinian evolution and explains 
why and under what circumstances life emerges. Claiming the existence of life simply as being the only intelligible explanation for observations within current knowledge an optical illusion, which had hitherto been beyond current knowledge. The ability to obtain fingerprints of molecular abundance in the atmospheres of extrasolar planets is most exciting from a geological perspective. What this could mean for such signatures hinting at life on such planets is actually not clear at all. Let's, for example, look at the Earth's oxygen history. Strikingly, life sustained for about 2 billion years with very low amounts of oxygen. Then oxygen rose to a higher level and stayed there for another billion years. And only for the most recent 600 million years, there was as much, much, much oxygen as we find today. This history is an interplay of evolving life with a very specific structure of planet Earth. The oceans and rocks affecting the atmosphere. Oxygen produced by cyanobacteria could be bound until the natural oxygen sinks got saturated. During this initial period, evolution was rather slow, and the catastrophic event of a sudden rise of oxygen levels came with a mass extinction of monocellular organisms and the rise of multicellular organisms. This shows that the emergence of multicellular and higher organisms was not a straightforward consequence of life emerging on a planet. There are further hurdles with their own specific conditions attached. Moreover, while we see evolutionary convergence, the mass extinction of species through catastrophic events reshuffles the cards and breaks the chain of predictability within a controlled environment. We should therefore not jump from astronomy to biology without taking into account geology. We also see that monocellular life can happily exist for a long time without substantial amounts of oxygen arising in the atmosphere. And the animals were the evolutionary winners with the later rise in oxygen. So life can easily escape detection. A very simple setup demonstrates nicely how challenging any detection of life by remote sensing is. We know that as life in a pot of yogurt, at least it says on the tin. But imagine you put it at just one meter distance from you. You're not allowed to touch it or get a probe. The only means is electromagnetic radiation. Is life so close? How do you prove that it is there? Finding life is hard. Not finding anything could st still mean that we're far from being alone in the universe. If there's only one life-bearing planet in the Milky Way, and if this is typical across the universe, hey, we're in the cosmic company of hundreds of billions of others. But wouldn't know. Exploring the universe in the search for ourselves is a venture that is most fascinating and most frustrating at the same time. What does it mean to be human? A question that cuts across all three classical pillars of philosophy, natural philosophy, metaphysics, and ethics, was central to an exhibit, a message from afar, showcasing the search for extraterrestrial intelligence at the 2019 Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition, which are designed and led for the UK Saturn Research Network. It is, in fact, the deeper question behind the popular, are we alone? Which is a question of natural philosophy alone. What distinguishes a signal from a message? How natural is intelligence? Is communicating information a fundamental principle of biology? Visitors could explore by means of colored cubes how to transmit a message by designing their own code. They were given a range of examples 
of how we encode the structure of human language by means of alphabets, symbols, and bits. While humans are not the only animals communicating by means of sounds, we also find that all known life passes on information through the common genetic code with its own alphabet and syntax. In looking for the most universal principles of nature and the roots of our existence, attempting to think within so-called disciplines drives a systemic failure, in my opinion. None of the disciplines has the answer. And people need to talk to each other, realizing that to a large extent, they're already talking about very similar things while contextualizing them differently and by using different language and terminology, which constitutes a substantial obstacle to progress. Withstanding pressure to provide answers, we moreover require clarity about what we don't know. There's a lot of wishful thinking around, but many lines lack connections. Many research agendas that I've seen on this topic remind me of the famous cartoon by Sidney Harris. And I would never buy a roadmap that only shows one road. A key project of the Network of Researchers on the Chemical Evolution of Life, or short LOSA, is to produce a gap map, which in contrast to a review that discusses what we know, aims at clearly spelling out what we don't know about the universality of biology. If you have any thoughts on this, you're most cordially invited to be part of our investigation. We need to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, indeed, a very good um, overview of the issue, I guess, in the end. It's, um, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's a fair problem we all face when, well, anyone that thinks about this, um, this question faces. How do you think it, 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 it how, how do we deal with it? How do we, so can it, can it be solved? The, the question of what is life or if there's life elsewhere in the universe? What it, I mean, well, perhaps I guess that the question of it, whether there is life in the universe or not, will it take, it will take a while to either figure out whether, well, if it just, it will only be, we only need like to pick, to find out one example to answer the, to for the answer to be yes, or just to expand our entire existence trying to find something for to, so, for it to be yes or no. So what do you think about that? So on the question of whether there's life elsewhere in the universe, I, I think we, we need to, to permit uh, for the possible outcome of that investigation to be that we will never know. <laughs> it, it's so easy for life to hide. Yep. You know, just imagine you, you have a planet that just covered in yogurt. Yeah. Yeah. That's in some far galaxy. I mean, it's hard to see how we will ever get there. So, um, so it's interesting to, to reflect about, about the fact that my, there might be deep questions that we won't arrive at a clear answer. Yeah. On the other hand, if we think about the emergence of life, I actually think we're not that far away. We have lots of interesting approaches. Uh, but I think we, we need to do some work to get these approaches together and really not to miss out on stating very clearly where the problems are. Because I see so many roadmaps that just say, you know, we will find this and then we find this atmosphere that tells us something about life. Yeah, but actually how? Yeah. And, you know, we're completely, we will never be able to detect life unless we can state what life actually is. Yeah. Well, if you go out and say, Someone said, show me the elephant in the zoo. And you don't say how an elephant looks like. You know, come, someone comes back and points at the zebra or 
you know, at a, at a dolphin because they don't know what elephant is. And I think currently, if we just talk about life in the sense of the, the terminology that we have that we have inherited over time, just you know, trying to define life as a kind of collective noun. Yeah. Right? We've seen things that we consider being life, and then everything that fits into that category, uh, we call life as well. It might not be, yeah. But yeah. actually, but actually structurally, the term is not defined. Yeah. So it's like how you define fruit, right? Fruit is this fruit, that fruit, that fruit, that fruit. Yeah, but what is actually, yeah. Yeah, I get your so, point. So, so we see it throughout biology, you know, still this concept of categorizing things um, that we've seen just by, you know, just collectively counting them is still prevalent. And we need to go beyond that. Uh, I, I think our increased understanding about, you know, information theory, yeah. about, you know, connect this to uh, uh, reaction kinetics, connect this to uh, statistical physics, you know, all, all these fields are connected. I yeah. think we, we don't explore these connections enough. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Because people, just, uh, people just don't talk to each other. It's probably, hopefully, that the, the way things are moving and taking the holistic uh, and integrative approach, um, I think of, it, it is the way to go. And it seems like there is some research being done in that direction um, from um, recent, really recent um Applications coming out, so we'll see whether we get up uh, to in the next few years, I guess. Um, but um, so I don't know if you wanted to, if you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, thanks very, thank you very much, uh, comrade. <laughs> well, you know, one thing's for certain: I'm never going to agree with anybody who says that it's questionable whether there is life out there in the universe or not. We know for a fact that all the physiochemical laws and all the, it's, we know so much about physiochemistry uh, that it is highly probable that there is life out there. I would stake my shirt on this too, to say that, that the life form out there will be carbon-based life form. And I could also say that, that There'll, there'll be bipeds like us out there somewhere in the universe. But we can never ever find out because life is huge. Uh, sorry, the universe is so huge that any bio signals that we receive would always be questionable. And we know that at least, uh, at least uh, about, um, say, 17, 18 biosignals uh, that we could actually detect, detect to ascertain whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. But from my point of view, my sole being on this planet Earth is just to answer one question. I'm not particularly bothered about whether there's life elsewhere in the universe or not. I'm not really bothered, you know. I don't care. What I'm really bothered about is this, can life be made in test tube? Because there may well be millions and billions of way of making life, but it just the way that the you know, life on earth appeared might be just one of the way of billion, millions and billions. So it'd be interesting. Uh, and this was actually motivation for the formation of network of researchers on the chemical evolution of life to gather all the people who are really, really interested in to find, talk about life. As uh, my friend uh, Martin and um, Elias has been discussing, you know, it is good to find, find that out, uh, that they're on the same page as I am. But I won't actually sort of, uh, would, I won't listen to people who say there isn't life out there, which is a lord, right? I won't buy that uh, part of the 
argument. As I said, I'm much more interested in if we can, if it's possible, and I do believe that it is possible. I know there are American scientists, uh, I think uh, Gerald Joyce, maybe one uh, NASA people, uh, he has got a system all, almost automated to, uh, to do experiments sort of every second of every day and night, you know, going on out there. So it's the only pro matter of probability. And the only thing about life actually is that we don't know how big the problem is. That's the main thing, isn't it? And if we could sort of get there and make it a test tube, and we could use that base for extrapolating life elsewhere in the universe. That's all I have to add, uh, my friend, uh, Pete. I mean, so if, I, if, if I may briefly answer to that. Of course, yeah. Um, I disagree. I mean, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you might have you might have noticed that I've very clearly stated that you know, the question that everybody comes up with, are we alone, is, is, is neither the biggest question of all nor the most fundamental one. Absolutely, I agree. And, you know, that is quite an important statement and quite, it's important to realize. Uh, also, a lot of people, sometimes in science, they use the word holy grail, which I don't like at all, because first, the word holy does not go well with science at all. And second, there is no such thing of, as the most important question. Uh, because similar to our approach to um, looking at the emergence of life, you know, we, we, have to, we have to approach things from different perspectives. And different things come together. And we advance science where different things come together, rather than just by deciding this is the most important question, we all march into that direction. That's not a good approach. Um, let me also say something about carbon chemistry and the, and the uh, chemical elements that contribute to life. Um, because I think it's not so much a question about the uh, abundance of certain chemical elements. <clears throat> if, if it was about the, the abundance, then we would you no, know, silicon is more abundant than carbon. We wouldn't have a carbon-based life. Um, it's not the most abundant elements that nature chooses to produce life, but it's about the versatility and the diversity uh, for building large structures um, that we see in the carbon chemistry. And it's not only the carbon alone, but how the carbon then interplays with other elements, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and to a further extent, sulfur and phosphorus. So these key elements of life are actually the same key elements of organic chemistry. It, it does make sense, doesn't it? Um, it, it is, is it exactly the same? It's just a subset of organic chemistry. And organic chemistry produces this diversity by not only producing hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons can produce you know, long chains, or they can produce cycles. Like, but still, hydrocarbons are somewhat dull. Right? They don't have this diversity in these properties. So you can build all these organic functional groups where you can uh, create lots of types of interesting reactions, thus making uh, use of the differences between electronegativity between carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And that's how you build diverse chemistry. Yeah. I think this is absolutely key. The one thing, the one thing that we really don't know is 
how chemistry would really behave under completely different conditions, under very different pressures and, and temperatures. We have insufficient knowledge about that. <laughs> and another very speculative thing is we don't know if there are stable, very heavy elements. How would their chemistry look like? Yeah. So those are the unknowns. Beyond these two unknowns, I, I agree with you. Life is just a subset of, of organic chemistry. That is absolutely straightforward. Martin, I have to, I don't know whether I should wise to use this word. I have to correct you actually. Without silicon, life is not possible on planet Earth. The reason I say this is because, as you rightly said so, that is most abundant uh, element around. But the thing is that you need silicon to carry out the chemistry in space, as I declared earlier on in my presentation, that I think anything surpassing 80% of the molecules were made in space and were delivered onto the planet Earth. And make, <clears throat> excuse me, making the atmosphere of uh, biosphere of, uh, uh, I, I mean, it's wrong for me to use the word biosphere because bio means that his life's already emerged. But anyway, the atmosphere of, of the uh, planet Earth, very planet, early planet Earth, that was, became the reducing when something becomes reducing, it becomes unstable. That means it's got a lot of energy into it. So all the carbon uh, compound has a lot of energy invested in that. And that's because of, uh, because of uh, uh, silicon, actually. And they were delivered ready-made. I would put it to you that way down. And functional groups are necessary. But one thing I'm going to add is this, that... Uh, I'm going to say it because I wrote about it about three times already, that it's the chemistry that we haven't discovered yet. And I actually call it probable chemistry. And the reason I use this fancy term for the probable chemistry is this. And we know that, for example, there are a lot of self-replicating systems on Earth, elsewhere in the universe, uh, elsewhere in the universe, and the chemistry is no different from that. Once you've got this self-replicating system, organic self-replicating system, then you actually get to make life sort of heading towards emergence. And how do you get those systems? Do you know something? It may well be taking place in nature, but they never get a uh, look in because nature eats it up, all the bacteria around it, all the chemistry gets eaten up. But these systems may already be on Earth still around. And as I said, as I said, we haven't actually touched upon, touched upon these ideas that, that people, please don't get me wrong, I'm not the first. Other people have spoke about it. There's a book by a guy called Tiber Ganti. That's a pretty good book. You know, I got it in my library. I read it, and um, and so I, I actually uh, put forward this idea about probable chemistry, and uh, the, uh, they're one of those reactions that requires to happen quickly, and it's unidirectional, and there'll be a few dead ends. Uh, it's because for life to emerge, it must emerge quickly rather than all over a protracted period of time. Either things are going to happen or it's not going to happen. That's the bottom, top and bottom of it. And so, yeah. So you. So, so just to clarify, there, there's no disagreement here. Well, uh, I said I disagree it, with you. Anyway, we it is. Love. No, you just, you, you just, you, you said you, you need to correct what I said. You didn't say you, you disagree. You just said I'm wrong. Uh, well, you're wrong about uh, uh, about the. Uh, about about no. chemistry, because no, 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 no. It's about it's about what what exactly I said, because I was talking about 
the the elements that constitute the major building blocks is structures of living entities. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it gets more complex than that because we need to look at all the processes, as you said very rightfully, that got us there. And there are lots of processes, for example, uh, that might involve surface chemistry, as you mentioned. Um, there are also other processes that involve uh, photochemistry. Uh, for a lot of life on Earth, photochemistry, in particular with UV photons, is important. Lots of other elements play a role. Um, so if you look at, uh, at our body, uh, we have um, um, organomatical, metal organic compounds that include iron, that include molybdenum. Uh, so for a specific route to life, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a lot of inter, that's a lot of interaction. No, the, the point is there's a lot of interaction between how the biology evolved within the non-biological -biolog environment. And this plays all a role. The other, um, all the other uh, yeah, I'm gonna reply to that, and I think we're going to have to leave in here. But yeah, feel free to, to go back to that. Um, I mean, there are valid points on both sides, I might say. I do agree with most of the stuff you were both saying, and it's not that, not that far away, as Martin said. But yeah, Sohan. I'm sorry? That if you want to add a, a last touch, a, a, a last point to that. Well, uh, well the thing is, um, uh, it's no need to introduce all the other elements. The reason behind it is that that's foregone conclusion. Each and every element in the periodic table do does play part, you know, one way or the other. But according to me, that the chemistry began with the with the silicon on uh, which lent itself uh, as a surface for the molecules uh, to be made. For example, hyd dihydrogen couldn't be made any other way. I mean, I can't, uh, one of the things astronomer, that's you, Martin, cannot answer the question, what was the original formation? How was the original hydrogen atom made? Uh, so, uh, sorry, dihydrogen molecule made originally in the absence of um, interstellar dust particle, we know that in the current day that interstellar dust particle are instrumental in making a molecular hydrogen. So astronomers <laughs> at loss, a loss about that. But anyway, I think, but all of the elements, uh, metals uh, uh, came later, uh, uh, you know, uh, but the, the originally you had to have oh by the way if i may digress just tad uh, look the important thing is that i came to now conclusion that that ribo uh, prot and nuclear proteins were uh, are instrumental i'm now focusing on those uh, because bringing in this idea about prime domains and looking into all of those kind of things now because uh, Hakim, if I may say, mm -hmm. that if two things happen, happen, I'm sorry, I have to take my glove on because I got a neuropathy in my one of my hands, um, is that uh, peripheral, peripheral um, uh, neuropathy, which means it gets cold very quickly. Yes, the thing does. about it is, um, proteins cannot make RNA, RNA can, uh, RNAs, RNA cannot make proteins. They cannot communicate after the event. They can't make chemistry happen individually. What might have, have to have happened is that both were interacting during the very, very early period of uh, uh, chemical evolution, very early. And I think where things goes wrong in relation to the origin of life is because as human beings, we like to box things up. In other words, we put them in the pigeonholes where everything belongs, which is totally and utterly, utterly the, wrong. The problem might be, 
us in, in, in itself. So we might never figure out the the actual answer to the to the to the questions. Not even the question, even if, if that if such a thing even exists. Because well, I agree with you, Hakim, uh, on that. Uh, the important thing, as I said earlier, is that um, I just want to know: Can it be done? Whilst I I'm alive in my lifetime, can it be done? I don't think so. In your lifetime, I think I think it's possibility. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. I indeed hope so. Um, I think it's we can leave it here. Um, but I'm well. I, I mean, this is definitely worth to continue in a, in a, in a discussion at a future time. Um, I'll, <laughs> we'll, we can explore that. Uh, yeah. I can just say uh, I just want to announce that um, um, uh, the. Astrobiology Society at um, Manchester or Man uh, Manchester Astrobiology Society are doing a super job. Thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting us. I do apologize for not putting your logo uh, on my PowerPoint. It is fine, it's fine. It, it, it just, that, it just that I've been busy. And as you know, we will announce anything that you do, your society does, we will announce it uh, 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 everywhere, you know, as per normal, like we normally do. And let's continue with this and kind of kind of support one another, you know, but uh, remain individual. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, as, as, as always, it's been, I think, since over a year ago, um, definitely. Let's say goodbye to the people on YouTube because we're still live in there, and I'll say probably goodbye to you all. So thank you for watching. Um, oh, those that have followed us, um, as you know, this might be one, our, one of our last events, but you can always stay tuned on our website, astrologyscity.com, or on our social media accounts. That's where we all post all our information. And yeah, thank you for being here with us today. All right.